All right, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we have two very fine speakers today in our second session. I'm, I am uh, Karen Carter. I am an associate professor in the history department here at BYU, and I'll be introducing our two speakers, and then I'll uh, let them take over. So first we have Dr. Carlos Ayer is the T.L. Riggs Professor of History and Religious Studies at Yale University and Chair of the Renaissance Studies Program at Yale as well. Dr. Ayer received his PhD from Yale in 1979 and before joining the Yale faculty in 1996, he taught at St. John's University in Minnesota and the University of Virginia and was a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton for two years. He is the author of numerous books, including two memoirs, Waiting for Snow in Havana, Confessions of a Cuban Boy, which won the National Book Award for Nonfiction in 2003, and Learning to Die in Miami, Confessions of a Refugee Boy. His books on religious history include War Against the Idols, The Reformation of Worship from Erasmus to Calvin, uh, published in 1986, From Madrid to Purgatory, The Art and Craft of Dying in 16th Century Spain, published in 1995, a Very Brief History of Eternity in 2010, and he is the co-author of Jews, Christians, Muslims, An Introduction to Monotheistic Religions in 1997. His most recent book is Reformations, the Early Modern World, 1450 to 1700, published by Yale University Press last year. It won the R.R. R. Hawkins Award for Best Book of the Year from the American Publishers Association, as well as the award for Best Book in the Humanities. And I was fascinated to learn from, re from uh, reading Dr. Ayer's CV that a Chinese translation of Reformations will appear in 2018. A biography of St. Teresa of Avila is also forthcoming from Princeton University Press. Dr. Ayer is the author of multiple essays and journal articles, and he lectures widely on topics related to his memoirs, as well as European religious history. We are delighted to have him with us today. Uh, the title of his talk is How the Protestant Reformation Redefined the Sacred and the Supernatural. And then our second speaker is Dr. Jennifer Powell McNutt. She is an associate, associate professor, professor of theology and history of Christianity at Wheaton College, uh, a fellow in the Royal Historical Society and director of Wheaton's MA programs in theology and history of Christianity. Dr. McNutt received her PhD in history from the University of St. Andrews in 2008 and a Master of Divinity from Princeton, Princeton Theological Seminary in 2003. She is the recipient of several academic awards, including the Sidney E. Mead Prize from the American Society of Church History and Wheaton's Leeton Riken Award for Teaching Excellence in the Humanities. Dr. McNutt specializes in the history of re the Reformed church, church and Clergy from the 16th through the 18th centuries. Her first monograph, Calvin Meets Voltaire, The Clergy of Geneva in the Age of Enlightenment, was published by Ashgate in 2014 and was awarded the Frank S. and Elizabeth D. Brewer Prize by the American Society of Church History. She is also the co-editor of The People's Book, The Reformation and the Bible, published this year. Dr. McNutt is currently co-editing the Oxford Handbook of the Bible and the Reformation and editing a volume for the Reformation Commentary on Scripture series. And finally, she is conducting archival research on the history of the French Bible from the early modern period through the Enlightenment. Her publications include many academic journal articles and book chapters as well as pieces for Christianity Today and Christian History Magazine. We're looking forward to her talk today on Replacing Dead Bones, Luther and the Advancement of the Vernacular Bible. Dr. Ayer. Let's see if we're all set. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, the uh, normal human limit tolerance for uh, listening to anyone talk I have discovered after 40 years of teaching is 45 minutes. So I'll try to keep my talk to 45 minutes. I want to thank um, Craig Harleen and everyone involved in inviting me to be here. It's a great honor to be here with you, and I want to thank you all for being here, too, in this uh, celebration of 500 years of the Reformation. And having two very hard acts to follow, I have this observation to make about the previous two presentations. And of course, it has to be a joke. <laughs> and I, was, I told uh, Craig this jo uh, that this, the joke this morning. It applies to all religions. A uh, man is shipwrecked on a deserted island for 30 years. And after 30 years, he's rescued. His rescuers are very, very puzzled because he lives in a grass hut 
but he has two beautiful and equally uh, ornate houses of worship on the island, and he is alone. So they ask the obvious question, why two? And uh, with great disgust, he turns around, wheels around, and points to one and says, you don't think I'd set foot in that one, do you? <laughs> the Reformation is all about fragmentation. Uh, as we have heard so eloquently, it's all about fragmentation. And it begins with Luther, but it doesn't continue with Luther. As a matter of fact, I have argued many times that Luther could have been killed almost immediately. And the same fracturing of the Christian world would have still taken place. It would have been different, of course, but there was so much brewing that it, what happened would have happened anyway without Luther. But Luther gave very important shape to it. And what I'm going to talk about uh, is sort of the, the, the infrastructure of the thinking that underlay the Protestant Reformation. You know, the fracturing takes place for many, many, many reasons. But for the fracturing to stay in place and continue and sort of the infrastructure of the secularism that follows on an intellectual level and a spiritual level is a redefinition of worldview, redefinition of what reality is and how the divine realm interacts or does not interact with the created world. Because for all their disagreements, for all of their disagreements, Protestant reformers tended to agree on this change in worldview. And before I get going, I have to let you know, of course, Luther was not at all interested in changing worldview when he began his Reformation. Zwingli down south in Switzerland was interested in changing worldview, and so and so it goes. But Luther eventually also kind of joined in to a considerable extent in this redefinition of reality, this redefinition of divinity, this redefinition of what is supernatural and what is natural and how the two interact. And uh, perhaps most vividly brought to life, it was mentioned before, the Marburg Colloquy in 1529. The major Protestant reformers go into the same room to discuss theology so that they can come together and form a military alliance against Emperor Charles V. And they agree on 13 points but they cannot agree on point number 14. And point number 14 has everything to do with the interaction of natural and supernatural. Is Christ really present in the Eucharist? Well, uh, my, one of my biggest uh, failures in teaching is I thought it would be a good idea to have my class reenact the Marburg Colloquy. <laughs> And um, I assigned parts to different students in the class. But the student who uh, was Luther showed up dressed in costume. <laughs> and he had memorized the entire transcript of the Marburg Colloquy. So of course he won the debate. Because <laughs> the other students just stammered in response. <laughs> anyway, what you see before you is um, Swiss iconoclasm part of this redefinition of the sacred. City, throughout city in northern Switzerland in the 1520s, you would see scenes like this where the images were removed. Why do something like that? It's, it's hard for most Americans to understand because we have so few symbols as a culture. But as Brad was saying, religion was more than just religion in this time period. And these, these images encode so much. And some of the individuals who uh, engaged in, in the breaking of images knew my favorite story, iconoclasm. In Geneva, 1535, it is young children or adolescents who engage in all the breaking. And um, 
after they had broken up the images, they went outside with chunks of plaster or stone or wood and threw these pieces at passers-by, saying, here we have the gods of the priests. Would you like some? And then they'd throw the chunk at someone, bang them on the head. But they understood that they were symbols of much, much more than the saint that they were rep representing. <clears throat> Those of us who deal with the Reformation today are still stuck with this man who's been dead for quite a long time, Max Weber. who spoke almost exactly a hundred years ago in this essay I'm quoting down at the bottom and that'll be the only footnote you will see. In his essay, Science as a Vocation, he said that the, the greatest contribution the Protestant Reformation had made to, to the West was the, translation in English is not the best, disenchantment of the world. The world was disenchanted the German that he used is much more precise. And Zauberung, Zauber in German is magic. The world had rid itself of magic. Anthropologists, and now increasingly historians, uh, prefer to refer to magic as thaumaturgy. <laughs> Same thing, hocus pocus mumbo jumbo, mecha like a high, mecha hiney ho, and things, uh, things change, right? But it's a view that, that begins with the Protestant Reformation. That Catholic ritual was no different than stage magic or pagan magic because it was false. And um, did the Protestant Reformation really disenchant the world? Or, or do away with its magic. I like to um, use this image as contrast of early definition of Catholic ritual as mumbo jumbo false magic. It's an engraving by Lucas Cranach that depicts the true church versus the false church. True church, of course, is Luther's church, and there you have Luther preaching the word uh, hooked directly from, by the text of the Bible to the Lamb of God, to Christ, who is the same thing, but Lamb represents the Eucharist, um, and God the Father with the Holy Spirit in between, and then there's only two sacraments. But look at the Catholic side. Look how angry God is, shooting fire and brimstone at everyone below, and the Catholics are involved in all their kind of magic um, so this begins very early. But the Protestant Reformation is a major shift in worldview. Worldview that is now the backbone of secular Western culture, where supernatural and natural are two very, very separate, distinct categories. And the Protestant Reformation uh, redefined three paradigms, or three basic key ways of thinking about the world, about reality. Matter versus spirit. How do matter and spirit relate to each other? Natural versus supernatural. How do these two relate to each other? You can also say creation and creator. How do they relate to each other? And uh, the third relates to the technical term in theology, eschatology, what happens after death, or what happens to human history, the here versus the hereafter. So most of my talk will be about this redefinition of these three different points. First, matter versus spirit. Luther was not willing to concede these points. This mostly applies to the Reformed Protestant tradition, but also to some extent Lutheranism. These two fra uh, Latin phrases up there, finitum non est capax infiniti, 
It's always fun to throw Latin out because it, it makes you look smarter. <laughs> the finite cannot contain the infinite. Foundation of Reformed Protestant metaphysics. The finite is incapable of conveying or containing the infinite. And the second quote, also in Latin, is from reformer Ulrich Zwingli. The physical detracts from the spiritual, or actually, uh, literally, the more you attribute to the material, the more you take away from the spiritual. Right? It's, a, it's an equation, like a mathematical equation, that matter and spirit are, in a way, uh, antithetical to each other. So matter is not just incapable of bringing, bridging the gap between heaven and earth, but is actually an obstacle. And in the Reformed Protestant tradition, God is radically transcendent. Of course, he had always been transcendent in medieval Christianity. In the Protestant Reformation, he is made radically transcendent. And this is despite the fact that Protestants continue to believe in the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. He still remains radically transcendent in the Protestant tradition. The supernatural realm is therefore a wholly other, above and beyond the natural and created order. And there you have some quotes from Zwingli, who argued that the things of earth were carnal and they were in enmity against God. He's not inventing this. This has been part of the medieval Christian tradition. But a different emphasis is being put on this that makes the antithesis between carnal and divine or spiritual stronger. And those who create uh, trust in any created thing whatsoever are not truly pious. John Calvin was um, equally adamant on this point. Whatever holds down and confines the senses to the earth is contrary to the covenant of God in which, inviting us to himself, he permits us to think of nothing but what is spiritual. Second big point, so big in fact that it takes up a good part of the lecture. Natural versus supernatural. And of course you can't separate matter and spirit from natural and supernatural. I'm separating them into different categories because they're, they're approached in different ways and the results of following one or the other are slightly different. Our modern worldview modern secular worldview. The universe is established certain laws that we can discern. That's what modern science does. We discover the laws of nature. Nature has fixed laws that are only overpowered by the divine in order to prove truth of a divine message. That's the Reformation take on natural versus supernatural. Yes, God created the world. Yes, he is in charge. But the laws he established, he breaks only at very, very specific times when he has a message to convey. So, the miracles that accompanied the revelation of God in the Old and New Testaments has ceased after that message takes hold, after the death of the last apostle, what we still in our age call miracles, that is the suspension of the laws of nature, ceased to occur. On this, all of the Protestant reformers agree, to a greater or lesser degree, but they do agree on this. The age of miracles has ended. When? somewhere around the year 100. Because by then the Christian message had taken root and the greatest miracle of all was the fact that Christianity kept growing despite the absence of miracles. So there are no 
post-biblical miracles. And then I, I have up there for you to uh, contemplate, meditate upon, a long list of religious phenomena that were part and parcel, and I would say more than that, were a central feature of medieval Christianity. No miracles, no mystical ecstasies, no visions, apparitions, revelations, levitations, bilocations, and all of these supernatural phenomena that were, in fact, what defined religion. And here's Luther, our friend, the middle-aged Luther. It's always fun to look at the different portraits of Luther to see how he gains weight. Uh, and his, his chin keeps uh, getting uh, flabbier and flabbier, which I now appreciate at my age. It's, uh, you know, it's too bad. <laughs> That's where you need the supernatural, right? Your, your chin starts to get a little wobbly and uh, you'd like for a miracle. Yes. Luther, too, rejected the uh, possibility of post-biblical miracles. And there you have uh, the essence of Luther's message about religion. Religion was not about altering the fabric of reality. Religion was really about salvation, justification, about defeating the devil because the devil was ever present. More about him in a few minutes. Being led to eternal life in heaven far surpasses all outward signs and wonders. That's a quote direct from Luther. There's the older Luther, slightly heavier. Look what he has to say uh, about miracles. He's very clear. Those visible works are simply signs for the ignorant, unbelieving crowd, and for their sakes that are yet to be attracted. But as for us who know already all we do know and believe the gospel, what do we want them for? Wherefore, it is no wonder that they have now ceased since the gospel has sounded abroad everywhere and has been preached to those who had not known God before, whom he had to attract with outward miracles just as we throw apples and pears to children. Human race outgrew the need for these miracles. However, told you he'd be coming back, the devil. He's central to the Protestant argument because, and, and think about it, Catholics are claiming all these miracles. It's central to, to the Catholic Christian. Protestants have to respond to all of the miracle claims of medieval Christendom. Yes, they have to admit Weird things happen. People actually believe that miracles are taking place, but they are really the work of the devil. The Catholic miracles are the work of the devil. And uh, Luther had a lot to say about the devil, especially at dinner time. You can find the best, uh, best quotes from Luther from the table talk concerning the devil. He ate dinner with his students just every night, I think, and they, many of them furiously scribbled everything he said. And if you read the table talk, you can almost like see Luther getting increasingly funnier and funnier and meaner, too, uh, with each beer. And he actually said the devil was a thousandfold artist, a thousand kunstler. And here's the basic story, the basic scoop on the devil. And this I find so fascinating. Although Protestants reject the medieval Christian worldview of the divine, they accept. 
the medieval Christian devil. Which means when it comes to the natural and supernatural, Protestants will agree, agree with Catholics on this point. The devil cannot perform miracles. The devil never performs miracles because the devil has no supernatural powers. The devil is a creature. He's an angel. He's not divine. So therefore, he has no supernatural powers. But the devil, because he's so old, he has been around for who knows how long, before even the creation of the world. And because his intellect is superior to human intellects, is like a good scientist who knows how nature works. And he knows how to manipulate nature. And people who associate themselves with the devil are sometimes given that power to manipulate nature like a good scientist. Or because the devil knows how to manipulate nature, he's very good at fooling people into thinking that miracles have taken place. And one of the thousandfold uh, magical things that the devil can do is shape shift. And he can appear as different animals. He can appear as an angel of light because St. Paul says so in one of his letters. You can, he can trick people. And the final uh, line on that uh, slide, true story told by Luther himself. So if it's, it's a false story, it's because Luther told the lie. But I don't think he was lying. When he was at the Wartburg, as we just heard, hiding out, translating the New Testament into German, he came to his room, which was very high up at the Wartburg, came into his room and saw a black dog on his bed that he had never seen before. So he did what any rational person would do <laughs> in 1522. He took the devil, and, uh, the, the uh, devil, yeah, he was the devil. He took, he took the dog slash devil and threw him out the window. And then ran all the way downstairs to see if the dog was lying there dead. And of course, there was no dog to be found. So he knew he had done the right thing. So the devil's very real. But why, why does the devil have the power to work miracles? There's a long explanation in text of what I just told you. The devil has preternatural powers, not supernatural powers. And uh, he can fool people. Certainly he can fool Catholics. He fools them all the time, all the time. So it's important to stress that this is a polemical argument as much as it is uh, an internally coherent argument within Protestantism. They need to prove that Catholic miracle claims are false in some way. And I think this is one of the reasons that the medieval devil becomes such a convenient figure in Protestant theology, because it helps explain all of that stuff. And actually, while I'm on this point, this is not part of my lecture, but I just thought this important to point this out. One Protestant reformer, John Calvin, goes even further. Because from the second century on, actually from the first century on, up until the 16th century, the standard explanation for false religion, why are there false religions? Why do so many people on earth believe in false gods? has always been, since the first century, the devil. The devil fools people. Now, the devil actually appears as Zeus or Isis or Osiris, or something, and people believe this. But John Calvin comes along and says, first book of the Institutes, no. False religion is invented by humans because of our fallen nature. We need to have gods like ourselves. So we project basically an early version of what you would get later in the 18th and 19th century. The argument that all religion is a human invention and a projection of our desires, needs, and fears. So 
So this explains witches. And this explains why Protestants and Catholics hunted witches with equal ferocity and actually, when trying witches, employed the same investigative methodology. <laughs> this also explains why uh, witches can fly. Witches can fly because they've made a pact with the devil. Or they can fly because they rub special oils on their bodies that make them think that they're flying. And there's our friend John Calvin, looking appropriately stern. Repeating the same thing. The ultimate purpose of all biblical miracle, miracles was not to alter the fa fabric of the material world, but to prove that revelation was, in fact, true. And then he moves on to say, yes, we may also fully remember that Satan has his miracles, which though they are deceitful tricks rather than true powers, are such a sort as to mislead the simple-minded and untutored. And then he quotes Paul, Thessalonians. Idolatry has been nourished by wonderful miracles, yet these are not sufficient to sanction the superstition either of magicians or idolaters. Notice, that's why I highlighted in yellow, magicians and idolaters are in the same category. This is a footnote of sorts. Lutherans especially continued to believe in natural wonders that were divine messages. Wunder. Mirabilia, not miraculi. God sometimes uh, sent messages through nature, cloud formations, uh, monstrous births, uh, hailstorms. Uh, rare occasions it still happens where if fish get suck, sucked up by a tornado from a lake and later it rains fish somewhere else. Or what happened to me in Minnesota, uh, when I was teaching in Minnesota, uh, my, my first heating bill was more than my income. So, <laughs> so I had to run out and find a housemate really quick to help pay the bills. And he was a very nice guy from North Dakota who uh, one night, without telling me, gave me Kool-Aid with grain alcohol. <laughs> and uh, I started seeing things. But the next morning I wake up and it's Minnesota, so I see three suns up in the sky. Sun dogs, he says. Oh, those are sun dogs. You know, it's just the ice crystals reflecting the sun, and you see, I actually do see three suns up in the sky. I thought it was because of the Kool-Aid from the previous night. <laughs> but there are actually uh, Lutheran broadsheets depicting all sorts of these events. I couldn't find the sun dogs. That's what I wanted to find for, for this presentation, but I couldn't find that. So instead I have this, uh, you know, starlings or crows messing together. It's always interpreted as a message from God that something's going wrong, right? Monstrous births, uh, these natural phenomena, yeah. But that doesn't count as a miracle. God still does this, but it's nature. There's nothing supernatural about it. So that's a footnote. So. <clears throat> even though supernatural miracles eventually work their way back into Protestant piety in various limited ways during the late 17th and 18th centuries, because they do. And then in the 19th century, especially here in America, boy, do they ever. Uh, the original Protestant theology has no place for any of it. And then another sub point within point number two, the mystical difference. In Protestant theology, that transcendent God who is wholly other cannot be intensely encountered in this life in the way in which for centuries medieval Christians claimed he could be encountered. There is no mysticism of the same sort as you find in medieval Christianity. And uh, the men and women who reached the pinnacle of holiness 
we're living proof of the divinization of matter. The three steps, purgation, illumination, and union. Essential to experiencing the fullness of God in this life, kind of a foretaste of heaven. All the Protestant reformers reject the possibility of this in this life. Now, later Protestants, uh, Jonathan Edwards is a good example of someone who had uh, quasi-mystical experiences. And there are other Protestants later, who, well, but I'm talking about the Protestant Reformation. <clears throat> Read any uh, life of a saint from the mid mid Middle Ages, and you will find that they can do all sorts of things. They, um, experience raptures, ecstasies, they go into trances, they levitate, they bilocate, they read minds, they prophecy, uh, they manifest the wounds of Christ on their bodies. Francis, St. Francis was the first to get the stigmata. All of these things the Protestant reformers say are either faked or they're the work of the devil. The devil is deceiving people. So, in addition to all this, Protestants abolish monasticism, which is the social structure, the institution in which mysticism and mystics are bred. And in doing so, they not only banish mysticism from Christianity, their version, it's also the largest redistribution of property until the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Another anniversary Another 17 year, right? I'll show you a few images of these things. My favorite, the lactation of St. Bernard by Alonso Cano. There are many depictions of this, but this is my favorite. It's in the Prado Museum. Can you see the stream of milk flowing from Mary's breast to Bernard's mouth? Yes, if you're ever in Madrid, in the Prado Museum, stand by this image there for maybe a half hour, maybe an hour or so, and just listen to what people have to say. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do when I'm in Madrid. My favorite was uh, an American college student there with a friend or something. She turned to her friend and said, this is religion? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> oh, the ecstasy of St. Teresa by Bernini, perhaps the most famous artistic rendition of one of these ecstasies. In case you're not familiar with what happened, you know, Teresa has this vision, there's a, 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 an angel, and she identifies him as a seraph because of his size. Pierces her heart with a dart. That's the correct word, not a spear, not an arrow. A dart, which is basically what you shoot from a crossbow. And it's a mystical ecstasy perfect mingling of pain and ecstasy, captured here by Bernini. The ecstasy of Saint Anthony, notice he's levitating, notice the shadow on the floor, he's up above the ground and Mary is up on, in heaven and the baby Jesus is in between her and Saint Anthony. And one um, day when I was sh showing this image in classes, Students always have impudent questions to ask, which is why I love questions from students. The more impudent, the better. Uh, student asked, uh, is uh, Anthony throwing baby Jesus at Mary, or is Mary <laughs> throwing baby Jesus at Anthony? And I said, just like in the case of Luther's 95 Theses, it doesn't matter if he nailed them or mailed them, he posted them. In this case, my answer was, uh, well, yeah, well, either way, it doesn't matter. They're just playing Jesus ball. <laughs> See, I'm being irreverent, just like those Protestant iconoclasts. This painting hangs in the Louvre Museum in Paris, Angels in the Kitchen, by Murillo, Spanish painter. The legend, we don't know who the saint is supposed to be, but the legend is, of course, the, 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 the friar obviously looks like a... Franciscan, had kitchen duty, but he went wrapped into ecstasy, levitated, and angels came to do his chores. That's the kind of stuff that Protestants say, no way, no way, dude, no way. 
And then the third area. I call it eschatological apartheid. The dead are dead and gone. This age, saculum, the root word for secular, versus eternity, eternitas, or as the Latin creed, ad seculi seculorum, for ages and ages, forever, forever. The here and now versus the hereafter. Medieval world, many historians have said, even if they don't agree with the worldview, they say yes, everything in the Middle Ages was sub specie eternitatis. Eternity was the horizon. Eternity, the afterlife, defined what you did in this life because your life for eternity was determined by what you did in this life. Now, Protestants don't reject that concept that this life determines in some way the afterlife, whether you have God's grace or not. But what they did deny was that there was a connection between human beings who are still alive and human beings who are dead. Max Weber, in another influential work of his on the ethic of capitalism, linking it to Calvinism, spoke of the Protestant ethic as this worldly asceticism, you know, self-control which has this worldly goals. And in this respect, I, I still kind of agree with what Weber has to say because, yeah, Calvinists are ascetics, right? But they're not being ascetics like the Catholic monks and nuns who are being ascetics so that they can experience God fully here and now and have a foretaste of heaven here on earth and levitate and bilocate and do all these other things. But more importantly, as I've already said, and I'll repeat it because it's so important, the dead are dead and gone. Living people cannot pray to dead people for favors, for intercession. Living people cannot do anything to help the dead people who are in purgatory. Because guess what? Purgatory doesn't exist. And not only that, salvation by faith alone. There's nothing I, for instance, there's nothing I can do that will give you merit in the eyes of God and help you be saved. It's all up to you. It's between you and God. <clears throat> now, quickly, for some extreme contrasts, some examples of what is left behind. But, let me emphasize, it's not left behind completely because half of Europe, or more than half of Europe, remains Catholic where this is religion. But you've got these two, two worlds now coexisting with each other, and as Brad pointed out, so eloquently, right? This leads to a lot of conflict, but you do have two worldviews in competition with each other in the West. This and the other, where none of this happens. Two saints I can mention to you very quickly. Saint Joseph of Cupertino, the best known levitator or flyer in Christian history, and in case you're also interested, patron saint of anyone who flies, and patron saint of test takers. <laughs> I'm serious, yeah. St. Joseph of Cupertino was a Franciscan who was very simple-minded. As a matter of fact, in his hometown, he was known as Boca Aperta, or open mouth. <laughs> he was so simple-minded that the Franciscans wouldn't take him. But eventually they do. But he would go into ecstasies, being a good Franciscan, at just about anything including natural things. Again, natural, supernatural. One story told about Joseph Cupertino. Someone cuts a pomegranate in half, and he sees the inside of that wonderful thing. And whoop, up he goes into ecstasy, levitates. And he would always make that sound, too, when levitating or something <laughs> like that. All you can read is he made a whoop. So I, 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 I guess it sounded like that. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. There he's levitating because he's, Franciscans have to keep moving him to ever more remote locations because he's such a distraction. 
So they move him to Osimo. You know, I can't remember if it's Osimo. It doesn't matter, but he's near the Holy House of Loretto. Uh, and he sees the Holy House of Loretto, and that alone makes him levitate. He also um, flew from one end of the nave to the other in the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi, and in doing so, converted a Lutheran prince who said, ooh, they must be right. <laughs> there he's levitating while saying mass, and there he's levitating to fix a, a cross that was falling over. <clears throat> but this nun, Sor Maria de Jesus de Agreda, had St. Joseph beat. And they're almost exact contemporaries, if you notice their dates of birth and death. They were all alive at the same time, and so was Descartes. <laughs> By location, she never left Agreda, ever, physically, but she visited the New World 300 times or more, not too far from here, what is now West Texas and Eastern New Mexico and evangelize the natives. Any of you here, I just a uh, show of hands, have you heard of the legend of the lady in blue, if you're from that part of the Southwest? Well, she's known as the lady in blue in, in Southwestern folklore, because she had a kind of light blue Franciscan habit. But that's not all. She has visions of the Virgin Mary, and the Virgin Mary reveals to her that she needs to have her autobiography written. So she dictates her autobiography to Sor Maria de Agreda, and she writes it down, and it amounts to over a million words. The English translation is four big, fat volumes. In this autobiography, Mary covers the life of her parents, Joachim and Anna, her childhood, her adolescence, her adulthood, birth of Christ, passion of Christ, the death of Christ, and what happens after Christ's resurrection. And lo and behold, Mary is really running the early church, not Peter. She actually tells Peter what to do. <laughs> and more than that, Mary is co-redemptrix of the human race with Jesus. Now you can imagine in the 20th century what this might do to some people. Let's talk about strange bedfellows. Very, very conservative Catholics who want Mary to be pronounced co-redemptrix love Maria de Agreda, but so do feminists, including those who don't like religion at all. Because here's a woman with, with such incredible power. She became best friends with King Philip IV of, of Spain and they actually exchanged over 300 letters, and she became an unofficial confessor to him, where he would confess his sins to her, and she would give him advice. That's a quote from her book, if you're interested, The Mystical City of God, not to be confused with Augustine's City of God, The Mystical City of God. In this text, it talks about why there's this new revelation in the 16th century, I mean 17th. And today, by sheer coincidence, wink, wink, by sheer coincidence, Catholics are celebrating the Feast of the Our Lady of Sorrows. An item included in the mystical city of God is that Mary begged God to let her feel every pain suffered by her son during the Passion and Crucifixion. And she did, according to the mystical city of God. And there's a 17th century image of our Lady of Sorrows. And guess what? Guess who mined the mystical city of God for information in producing a film about the passion of the Christ? None other than Mel Gibson. Uh, and the, those very, very graphic uh, scenes that many objected to as unnecessary are taken straight from the mystical city of God. And with this, Calvinist churches in the Netherlands. A Calvinist church in France. Celebration of the Mass, the miracle of St. Gregory, where actually the Christ uh, comes bodily, appears bodily, 
to Gregory. One of the most often depicted scenes in medieval art is this miracle of St. Gregory. Two worldviews that are very different. One of them is much more uh, in keeping with our secular worldview than the other, unless you live in certain parts of the world. But in our world here, one is much more similar to ours than the other. And um, there you have it. Supernatural is redefined. Thank you. <laughs>